Okay, so I want to give a better explanation for the rule that we learned in our last lecture, which was on the opening of epoxides. And essentially in the class, what, what we got to is that I said that opening of epoxides with a nucleophile um, has to occur so that we have a trans-diaxial ring opening. So <clears throat> looking at this, what it means is that the nucleophile must come in in such a way that it ends up in an axial position and, and the O ends up in an axial position in the product. So either this can attack this carbon or this carbon and we work out which one it is by knowing the rule that it must be a trans-diaxial ring opening and to decide what that is we look at say this isopropyl group which will act as a locking group and we say that this must be in an equatorial position so it's equatorial up, equatorial down equatorial up. Okay, so that means that this one, this bond over here, is in an equatorial position, which means that down is axial, which means that the sulfur anion wants to come in from this position, because it'll end up down, and this will open up like that. And so our product <coughs> will look like this over here. So this is what we needed to <coughs> we needed to, to know and we needed to learn, was that it's transdiaxial ring opening, um, and of course this is a an O minus, um, which can pick up a proton on workup uh, if we add some acid. Okay, so looking at this again, we know that this position over here wanted to be equatorial, so it was equatorial, equatorial up, equatorial down, equatorial up. So this one is definitely axial and uh, this one over here must also therefore be axial. So this is correct, it's the transdiaxial, this is the diastereomer that forms, the other one does not be, it's, it's, uh, we, we, we don't get that one, or very little of it. Okay, so this is the major diastereomer in the reaction. Right, now I gave you the rule, this is a transdiaxial ring opening, but why does it go that way? Okay, the explanation of this is quite is quite complicated, but I want you to understand it because it applies to a whole host of other reactions, and it starts by understanding that this, the epoxides and cyclohexane rings have a three-dimensional shape, which is very much very similar to the cyclohexene chair conformation, which you can find in another video which I did. So when we draw this out over here, we can actually draw it out instead of having a double bond, it's kind of like this is a double bond over here. We don't have that, we've got an epoxide there, so we, we draw the epoxide in. It's facing on the up, it's up, and then we've got the two carbons on either side, and then we've got our, let's get that right, sketch it neatly, all right, and then we've got our cyclohexene chair conformation, or this half chair, but it's actually with an epoxide, so it's not. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, we've got the epoxide on the up face, and this, all right, is facing up. We have to put it on this carbon over here. If you count everything around, you'll see that it must be there, and that means that the isopropyl group is facing up over there. All right, so that's our first problem. The first structure that I drew turns out to be the wrong conformation. So we need to switch the chair around. So we're going to switch it, we twist it. So this carbon is going to come down. This carbon is going to go up. Uh, it's in equilibrium, and the equilibrium, of course, is favored to where this becomes equatorial. So uh, it's easy enough to do it. We just do exactly the same thing again. <coughs> All right, and once we've done that, we can. Uh, fill in the rest of the carbons, and now we actually go down, up, up, down, like that. All right, so that's our chair conformation. Just remember that whole thing at the back is a bond. It's one bond. I know it's exaggerated, but this is just so that we can see this properly. And now it has to be up, but it has to be up equatorial, so it's over there. Okay, I'm not drawing a wedge there. It's just a, a deep line, a, a dark line. Okay, I haven't drawn a wedge. Don't be fooled. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so this is the preferred confirmation. And now the issue that we're looking at over here is, and this is where the, the difficulty comes in understanding this, so, so you need to uh, watch carefully, is that the nucleophile has two positions it can come in from. It can come in from over here. It has to come in behind the electrophile, behind the bond that's going to break. So the nucleophile can come in from this carbon, which we've already worked out is actually the right carbon, but let's just um, think about it on it can either come from this carbon over there and this kicks out or it can come in over here 
and this one kicks out. Now the reason that this goes, this transdiaxial goes, has everything to do with the transition state of how this molecule starts to change. Um, while it's true that this is an sp3 hybridized carbon, it's actually very distorted because of the three-membered uh, the three-membered ring. And so we can kind of think of it more like being sort of flat like this sp2. It's not in, it's not entirely correct, but the the ring is held in this sort of shape. And what happens is when a nucleophile comes in over there. In this case, we've got this SME nucleophile. When it comes in over there and this bond breaks, in the transition state, this carbon over here is going to become more sp. It's because of the release of that ring strain, it becomes more s. It becomes properly sp3 and tetrahedral. And as it does that, because this is coming over there, this whole carbon sort of pulls down towards it. All right, towards this nucleophile, it's like they're sort of meeting up with each other, and as it does that, this carbon-carbon bond, in a sense, sort of pivots around in in this direction. So I put my pencil there; it's going to swing like that. So, in other words, this carbon over here is going to be moving upwards, and this carbon over here is going to be moving downwards around a central uh, pivot point over there. And as it does that. The shape that we get intermediate, and it's not particularly easy to, to, to draw this out. I often get this wrong, so give me some, be patient with me. This is what happens. So this is the bond that's being formed. I mean, it should be dotted lines, and it's a S SME, uh, and we've lost the oxygen. So we're going up over here. This is the O minus, and this is um, <clears throat> like that. And this structure that's been drawn over here is actually more like a boat than like a chair. All right? This structure over here is more like a boat than like a chair. In fact, it's called a twist boat uh, um, uh, transition state, and it's a high energy transition state. If the nucleophile comes in from this side over here, from the other side, Okay, then this whole thing as it twists is going to be twisting in the opposite direction. In other words, this carbon is going to come down, this carbon is going to go up. And notice as it does that, as this carbon pulls down and this pulls up, this bond as it sort of spins around in an anti-clockwise fashion goes like that. It's going to become parallel to this bond that's behind there. And that is more like a uh, the chair that we are used to seeing before, where all these lines are parallel. So the intermediate of this, and this one is actually a whole lot more uh, difficult to, to draw, is something a little bit like that. See, this bond is busy switching round, switching round, and so we get the, the SME was there, this one is the isopropyl group, and this is our O minus over there. So you see, as this has twisted around a bit, it's twisting, this thing is becoming a more like a chair, which is a favored uh, transition state. It's energetically, there's less of a penalty. And so we get this um, uh, intermediate being formed uh, over there. All right, so it's the, it's the twist chair. And this this is the uh, the real reason why epoxides, its transdiaxial ring opening is preferred. Now, I know this is a bit higher grade, but I want, I, uh, I want to leave you with a question that I want you to uh, uh, consider, and it's actually going back to our favorite alkylation of uh, enolate or enolate chemistry. And so I want you to think about, all right, what would be the preferred stereoisomer, okay, of the reaction between this enolate, which I've generated via um, some mechanism, and let's not worry about that for now because it may be a bit more tricky to say that we could really form it uh, like this, where this one is uh, pointing up. We'd actually get a mixture of enantiomers. That's not important, not important. Okay, and we are going to be reacting that with, um, let's just say, uh, propyl bromide 
And the product we get, and you should be able to do this, of course, is the profile group is going to go into this position. You should be able to draw out that product. But what I want you to do is I want you to th figure out whether the profile group in the product is going up or if it's going down. Okay, so let me just draw that product out for you. You should be able to do it. Uh, and ketone. So this is where we have the propyl group attached. Is this, all right, this group here going down or is it going up? Because there is control in this reaction and we have one major uh, product that gets formed and it has everything to do with what I've shown you over here. So try and Try and see if you can apply this kind of thinking. Of course, now we've got a double bond here. We don't have a, uh, an epoxide. But try and see if you can apply this sort of logic to work out whether this is going uh, up or down. For some of you, this is going to be a lot of fun. For most of you, it probably isn't. Um, but I would uh, recommend that you just uh, give it a try uh, anyway. All right, good luck with that.